Hey and welcome to the Groovy Track for the second session. Um, this is um, Narisha Cave uh, from India and his session will be um, a talk on what's in Groovy for functional programming. Uh, we have about 35, 40 minutes and I'll just uh, jump in when we're about to stop. And hopefully there'll be time for the Q&A at least in the chat afterwards. But there's nobody stopping us, so you can just continue. So I'll drop off the uh, stage and leave it to you. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Soren. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, let's uh, get started uh, with what's in Groovy for uh, functional programming. My name is uh, Naresha. Uh, I run the Bangalore uh, Groovy user group in addition to my day job. And when it comes to functional programming in Groovy, let's start with uh, what is the difference between the philosophies of uh, functional programming versus uh, object-oriented programming. Groovy started as an object-oriented programming language. And we see Object-oriented uh, idea is about, uh, you know, designing the code by encapsulating the moving parts. Whereas uh, in functional programming, we try to minimize uh, the moving parts, uh, the code more uh, declarative. So Groovy has uh, features for both object-oriented design as well as uh, for functional design. Having said that, most probably when you use functional programming in Groovy, uh, it, it would be very rare that you would end up with the pure uh, functional programming. Instead, you will use combination of functional programming along with object-oriented programming. Typically, the way it would work is at a high level, you would have object-oriented design. And, uh, and what happens here is, you know, there could be certain uh, modules wherein uh, functional programming would be much uh, beneficial. So in that case, uh, you will have smaller islands of uh, functional programming, which is, you know, uh, connected uh, by object-oriented uh, design. That, that's how uh, the design would look like for the entire uh, application. Uh, just to set the level, the, you know, the field, the level field, we'll just start with the regular functions, what uh, you would use Groovy. Uh, here uh, we start with the, uh, you know, uh, greet function. The first one has a single argument. Second one has uh, no argument. Uh, and uh, the last one has uh, two arguments. But uh, you can't do much with the regular function. So you will have to convert uh, these to closures. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. I took the first uh, function, greet, uh, which uh, accepted uh, you know single argument, and uh, the way I would uh, convert it to closure, you know, looks uh, fairly simple. You would uh, use the code block and uh, uh, the arrow sign, you know, which uh, the whatever precedes that becomes argument list. Whatever is follows that becomes the you know uh, closure body. And you can assign a name the way you would, uh, you know, assign a value to any variable, right? So that's how we would uh, end up uh, with these. Also to be noted here is that by default, uh, closure will accept a single argument and that is uh, called as it. So you have both uh, versions here where, where you explicitly name the single argument as well as, uh, you know, the, you use the implicit, uh, implicit naming. So closures are what uh, are like, you could say more uh, powerful functions uh, in Groovy. So we'll go ahead and use that after we you know, finish uh, converting other two functions to closure as well. 
So in case of functions, obviously you could uh, do overloading, but uh, you know uh, you cannot have two closures named as greet uh, in uh, you know in single context. Uh, just to make uh, that clear before we proceed. And similarly, if you have uh, multiple arguments, uh, you know you just uh, separate uh, the arguments uh, uh, by uh, comma. That's uh, what you have to do to create closures. Now, an interesting aspect to be noted here is that. Uh, when we say functional programming, functions are uh, first-class citizens. Functions are values, and they can be assigned uh, to any variables the way you would uh, do with uh, other values. Like here, I have a message "hello," uh, an age uh, thirty, something like that. Similar way, I can create a you know value called uh, "greet," which uh, which what what uh, what it makes or what the benefit it offers here is that you know I can use uh, take "greet" and pass it as an argument to any other uh, functions or closures, etc., without having to, you know, rely upon uh, object versions. Now let's uh, take a sample data. What I will be using uh, almost uh, throughout uh, this presentation. I have a class called uh, a Developer, which has name, age, and uh, skills, and I have uh, some uh, sample data created here. Let's start with the very familiar imperative code where uh, I have uh, you know, a list of uh, developers and I want to find uh, all the developers who know Groovy. So I start with the, an empty list and I start iterating with the help of uh, for each loop. Whenever I find uh, you know, a matching object, I'll just add it to the list and finally I return that, which, which would be a typical uh, you know, imperative uh, technique what we would use. So let's try to refactor this code and uh, try to move towards uh, idiomatic uh, Groovy. So what we did here is we, we see that we have a function called uh, find all, which uh, I can invoke, to which I can pass a closure. So with that, the code becomes uh, fairly simple. In case of uh, uh, the imperative code, I have, I have used a lot of uh, external iterator here, uh, like the for each loop, and uh, modifying the uh, state there. Instead, here I use a higher order, uh, you know, function find all. Uh, this is higher order because it accepts uh, a closure, right? Any function which which accepts a closure or uh, returns a closure is a higher order function. Now let's uh, take uh, this method and uh, you know uh, try to improve it uh, further. So previously it was pretty much uh, you know uh, implicit. It was in line. I didn't uh, name the closure. I didn't assign it to a value. I just use the extract uh, you know variable uh, uh, refactoring technique. And uh, extract uh, no into no's uh, groovy, and now you 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 can uh, see that you know find all is uh, accepting uh, no's groovy as the argument, which can be more generic. Now looking at this code, we we can see that now it's pretty much hard coded for groovy language. Obviously, we would uh, want uh, this method to work uh, for other languages as well to search for developers with other skills. So it would be much better if you could uh, pass that uh, from the outside rather than uh, uh, creating this inside of find group, I mean, find Groovy developers method. So we do further, uh, you know, refactoring to get uh, pass the closure as uh, an argument here. And finally, we just uh, use that in the uh, argument to find out method. So we have uh, the more, more generic version. I named it as uh, find developers instead of uh, find Groovy developers because that makes uh, more sense. So previously we created uh, that uh, you know uh, closure that uh, contains uh, this uh, you know uh, dev dot skills dot contains Groovy that kind of uh, check or the predicate. 
So if you don't want to hard code that, say you want to get it from uh, some persistent store, or say uh, you want the user to specify that as an input and uh, you know create something like that. So what we would need is we would need more generic version of that. That is what I'm achieving here uh, with the create uh, you know skill finder uh, method function, which uh, returns uh, closure for the given language. So take the language, I uh, use that to create a closure here and my uh, function will return the required closure. And I can invoke uh, this function to get a closure for Groovy, closure for Java or uh, anything like that, which, which can be passed as the argument to find the developer's method. With this, we have made uh, our code uh, more and more generic. So this is where uh, we are at uh, the moment. I have repeated this for uh, Java as well. And uh, you know, if you notice this, right, I am uh, passing uh, different uh, strategies here, and uh, you could readily uh, identify uh, this as you know strategy pattern instead of using the object-oriented flavor of that. We are using uh, functions for uh, representing strategies, and I have uh, two closures as uh, command one, command uh, two, which are doing some operation. And uh, notice how I could uh, create a function which accepts uh, any closure as uh, you know argument. And I could directly invoke uh, that closure as if uh, it's a uh, you know, fun regular function. With this, what I can do is uh, you know, uh, I can represent command using a closure and uh, invoke uh, my run command for executing my uh, uh, commands and it's a typical uh, command pattern as you would see so in a language that supports higher order functions you uh, i mean uh, you know the command pattern becomes very very trivial it's available right out of the box you just use a function to represent that and uh, because i can also since uh, you know functions are or in, in this case closures are uh, first class what i could do is i can uh, put command one and command two uh, you know these closures in uh, in a list in this case and i can iterate through that and uh, you know perform apply uh, run the commands one by one uh, natural evolution from uh, you know command pattern is something which i can always uh, before invoking the command i can do some action, some pre-processing maybe, and uh, after invoking the command again, I can do some post-processing in this case. So, which which uh, you know leads uh, to execute around pattern. So, all these patterns are becoming very uh, trivial by using closures. Now, let's uh, understand this. I have a closure called uh, add, which takes uh, two arguments a and uh, b, and I'm returning the sum. So we have an invocation here. I could pass say 10 and uh, 20. Now, what I could do is from this function or from this closure that accepts two arguments, I can create a closure that accepts one argument by fixing one of the argument. In this case, let's say I'll fix A as one, which results in a new closure, which you know just takes a one argument, which, which I can call it as increment so when i call increment it's essentially you know a has been already fixed as one at the you know the b value of that and uh, I, I would uh, get a new closure and i could invoke that so this is typically called uh, uh, you know uh, i mean the concepts of partial application and currying are uh, slightly different usually currying is all about uh, fixing uh, one argument at a time Partial application, typically you could uh, fix more arguments. So what is offered in Groovy is mostly partial uh, application. So I could uh, say if I have a function that has three arguments, I could fix uh, you know the first two uh, by passing curry two values, something like that. Whereas curry, it will be you know one at a time kind of. So so languages like uh, Haskell, uh, they are, have uh, the functions always curried. So you just have. Uh, one argument for every function, in, which in turn may return another function. So now let's see how uh, we, we could make use of uh, this currying because often I would say, okay, the idea of currying is something uh, simple and we can understand, but uh, where we could use these in uh, functional programming. 
So this is what uh, we had already done. We created that uh, generic uh, create skills finder uh, uh, function, and uh, we created derived uh, you know other uh, closures. So let's uh, use this. What I want to do is uh, I want to create a function called uh, first names of dev, which accept uh, accepts two arguments. Uh, one is the list of uh, developers that is my input data. I could also have uh, referred to this uh, from the lexical scope, but uh, in the spirit of uh, keeping uh, pure functions, uh, you know, uh, I, I didn't want the function to depend on anything else uh, that's outside. So. The second argument you would see we uh, it's expecting a closure. What I do is that you know I pass the list of developers uh, to the closure, and I'm expecting a kind of a filtered list of developers who who have that uh, skill. Then finally, I uh, take the result and apply map transformation and uh, get uh, you know names of the developers. So ideally, I would expect a list of a string as a uh, output uh, you know which is indicated in the return type here but there's a kind of uh, incompatibility here we have a more generic version of uh, find developers we don't have uh, something for uh, find uh, developer find groovy developers right which is what uh, i'm uh, expecting uh, here so how could we derive that uh, you know closure that accepts one argument from the closure that accepts uh, two argument by fixing my uh, second uh, argument that is what we are trying to do here uh, in this case i'm using uh, r curry because uh, you know the argument uh, i want to fix is uh, happens happens to be the last one so from the right side i want to fix the argument so i call it as a, you know we call r curry on find developers closure passing uh, my uh, nose uh, you know groovy predicate what i have which uh, i would call it as a groovy dev selector so this is uh, where uh, you know I would uh, use. Uh, I mean, I'm using uh, currying here, and which then I can pass uh, to call the first uh, names of uh, devs function. Uh, so if you notice, what we are doing is we are kind of uh, inverting, uh, you know, the dependency kind of inversion of control here, uh, because we could have also passed a filtered uh, list into this. Uh, function whereas uh, now instead we decided to pass the function higher order into first names of dev which is uh, responsible for executing the given function which also we call it as you know a dependency injection so we could uh, create the right function and uh, you know inject uh, into others that's uh, where uh, typically you would uh, use uh, you know uh, curry so this is uh, we already have uh, how to filter by say java developers and groovy developers something what i want to do here is i want a you know list of developers who know both java and uh, groovy so what we can do we already have uh, you know the curried uh, closures groovy dev selector and java dev selector the question comes is how i am going to get java and groovy dev selector which uh, you know obviously has to be a closure so what we can do here is uh, we can use the function uh, composition uh, using this uh, you know double arrow you could use it in uh, either ways it's always uh, you know you have to take the the direction of the arrow so it starts with the java dev selector that is my uh, first uh, function or closure and the output of that is passed to the you know groovy dev selector closure and the uh, you know the resulting uh, data is what uh, you, would be available as uh, you know java and groovy dev sector so it's not the data it's the function itself in this case here you, you can put it in the other way also but what is more important here is that the output of uh, java dev selector should match with the input type of uh, groovy groovy dev selector uh, in this case it happens to be list of uh, developer objects so that that's important uh, in order to get uh, this composability so that's a function uh, composition and also note that uh, you know first uh, names of devs expects exactly one function so that's the reason why i had to compose you know that uh, function use uh, from multiple other uh, closures so let's uh, take a look at uh, you know uh, some of the map filter reduce uh, together uh, most of you might be already familiar with this uh, 
is a very idiomatic uh, way of uh, you know groovy programming so what i'm doing is upon developers i'm first calling this higher order uh, method uh, find all which is a uh, filter uh, equivalent collect is a map operation and uh, finally i am uh, finding the average by invoking uh, you know uh, whatever the result dot sum divided by result uh, dot uh, size so that's uh, what uh, was available in groovy traditionally from a long time even uh, before uh, you know java 8 but uh, as you might uh, be already aware of uh, java 8 introduced uh, streams uh, api what is interesting to be noted here is that the closures are uh, very much uh, compatible with the streams api so you know to the filter map all these are uh, part of uh, streams api i am passing the same uh, you know uh, closures which i was uh, using earlier also and another uh, advantage sometimes why you may want to uh, opt for streams api rather than uh, your typical uh, groovy collect uh, find all etc is because uh, streams are uh, you know lazy api so sometimes uh, you may see that uh, the execution order is interleaved it uh, it's not uh, the in the order of uh, you know the way you specified because it's interleaved it uh, also has a disadvantage that uh, it's kind of uh, you know maintains a state it's like uh, you know uh, iterator maintains a state you could you cannot reuse the iterator the same way uh, streams also you cannot uh, you know create a stream once and reuse it multiple times that is not possible so every time you'll have to create a new stream if you want to you know uh, reinvoke any of the methods so that's the trade off uh, whether you want to stick to the regular uh, groovy apis or you want to you know move to or embrace uh, you know uh, java streams uh, api another important uh, aspect when it comes to functional programming is uh, you know uh, to use uh, pure functions and uh, immutable data this go hand in hand uh, pure functions are you know functions that uh, don't uh, produce any side effects and then they don't rely upon any side effects and uh, if the data is immutable obviously you know there is no way to change that which makes a good foundation for building your pure functions let's see what groovy has uh, to favor uh, immutable data a typical case uh, what uh, from from java you would see something like uh, you know say developers dot sort which would uh, you know uh, modify the the original uh, list developers here in place which with which you you will lose the you know immutability it is mutable instead of that groovy offers uh, you know alternative methods like uh, uh, the sort which accepts uh, you know a boolean flag right whether it should mutate or not the moment i say false it means that it should not mutate instead of mutating uh, the original uh, list developers it will create a new list and uh, return that so usually the second is uh, favorable uh, than the first option and also if you have a list and you want to make uh, the list immutable you could uh, call as immutable and uh, after that you are not able to add or remove anything uh, from the collection if you want to create a immutable class what you could do is uh, you know you could just uh, use the at immutable ast transformation what uh, that does is you would see that uh, all the fields are uh, final there are no setters uh, created only getters are available uh, and also you know to pass uh, the data he, of course you have uh, a constructor that uh, takes all arguments and also there is a map uh, constructor which is handy because you know i really don't have to remember the order uh, in which uh, you know uh, especially say i have five six uh, arguments it would be hard to remember uh, the order in which uh, this occur so rather than i could use something like uh, named arguments which is uh, I mean, that's a uh, kind of syntactic sugar, but actually what's available here is the, you know, uh, map uh, constructor under the hood. So let's uh, see how uh, we could use, uh, you know, reduce operation using uh, iteration, uh, which uh, is also called as a uh, fold uh, left. Uh, so I call the inject function with uh, this, this is optional. Uh, if I have one, I could use the uh, initial value. Otherwise, uh, it will start with the you know first and second, and then keep on folding from left to right. 
So I, I have to pass a closure here. So I take, uh, you know, zero, zero and uh, one becomes the item in the beginning. Uh, then I add that, that sum is, you know, folded uh, next so and so. This is a typical uh, iteration approach. But sometimes in uh, functional programming, you might want to use a more uh, iterative approach, uh, you know, depending on the uh, data type, if it is more uh, not, uh, you know, uh, index based uh, type. Uh, you may want to process in a more uh, recursive approach. That is what uh, is available here. Essentially, what I want to highlight in this code is like you have, uh, you know, this head and uh, tail, uh, uh, you know, functions available on uh, collection here. Head will be typically the first uh, item. Tail will be the rest of that. You keep on uh, calling this uh, sum recursively and, uh, you know, uh, you take the first from the uh, tail, you get the first and the rest of the rest of the items are uh, from tail. So this is a recursion alternative. When you go for uh, recursion, sometimes what happens is uh, uh, you might uh, end up with the stack overflow because uh, you will have to, you know, uh, if there are too many invocations, method invocations, uh, so many stack frames have to be created and finally you will end up with the out of memory. Uh, approach which uh, prevents that is uh, called uh, tail call optimization which can be applied if uh, you know your function ends with the you know the the end of the function is exactly the function call itself there is nothing else so in this case i have uh, slightly rewritten uh, the factorial uh, you know the signature so it starts with the you know factorial of number and uh, fact i have put it as a one as the default value now you would see the you know uh, the call is if it is zero, obviously it's uh, you know return one. Otherwise, uh, you call the factorial with the number minus one, and the second argument becomes factorial into number. So with this, you can uh, invoke uh, you know large uh, for the large numbers, and uh, you don't have to worry about uh, many stack frames uh, getting created. The way it works is uh, like this: instead of uh, the function invocation what happens here is the function uh, substitution so you would see you will start with the uh, say three and one which can be you know substituted as uh, uh, you know two comma you know the fact into number it is one into three like that i can go on reducing finally i'll get uh, six without uh, creating additional uh, stack frames so th th this can also give a uh, good performance benefits yeah, and the thing to be noted is, uh, you know, all you have to do is, uh, you know, put a tail recursive along with, uh, you know, your uh, signature alignment. Next one is, uh, you know, something where uh, you have a lot of, uh, let's say you have a function here, time consuming operation, uh, which takes a lot of time to execute and it is supposed to be pure also. Actually, thread dot slip is not pure, but uh, just to, you know, make, uh, simulate, uh, you know, a heavy computation, I just, uh, put it there. So now you would see that uh, first time when you make a call, you know, uh, I'm making the call here thrice, every time it will take a minimum of uh, five seconds, so five plus seconds. So the first result will be printed, then it will take five seconds, the ne next uh, you know, result will be printed, it will go on like this. Instead, if I use, uh, say, at uh, memoized, what happens is uh, the first time when it is computed the value, the result will be cached. Next time when I uh, invoke the function, the value is readily available uh, memoized. So it, it would just uh, take that value from the cache and uh, uh, give the re result rather than actually invoking the function itself. There are a few other flavors of, uh, mem <coughs> excuse me, memoized uh, wherein which uh, you could, uh, you know, say how many maximum items you want to cache, uh, so and so. So essentially, that's uh, you know performance uh, benefit you get. But uh, for this to work, uh, the function has to be pure. If the function uh, causes some uh, side effects or uh, depends on side effects, then uh, you will not get a consistent answer. Well, those were, uh, you know, the highlights, uh, some, some of the features available in uh, Groovy for uh, functional programming. I have uh, some blog posts uh, written about uh, this and the link is uh, available uh, here. And I think uh, we have time for questions.
Are there any questions? Uh, you only uh, see the questions in the chat. Uh, there's no audio for. Uh, yeah. Uh, I haven't seen any questions so far. So if uh, there are no further questions and uh, we have about 10 minutes till the next session. Let's uh, reshow the link to the blog. Yes. Thanks, Scott. I want to thank uh, Narisha for taking his time to do this presentation. He'll be back again in 40, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, yeah, 45 approximately, minutes. doing a talk called Effective Java with Groovy, how language influence adoption of yeah. good practices. Well, thanks uh, everyone. I hope uh, that was useful and I hope to see you, see most of you in the next uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. See you a little bit.